here where I look in the camera and go, hi, I'm Daniel Pemberton, and we're gonna talk about, I imagine, lots of stuff I've done before. Now I'm gonna look this way, yes. Daniel, thanks so much for coming to my house. That's okay. <laughs> we're sitting in my living room right now. Uh, you're you're here from London, uh, just doing on business and attending a few meetings and stuff, so I really yeah. appreciate, because um, you don't have your studio here, so we're in my home studio, kind of. Um, so, but to start off, I would love to kind of talk about kind of your background and, and beginnings, kind of remembering back to your childhood and what were kind of those moments that you remember that kind of set you on the path to becoming what you're doing today and what was that kind of initial part that set you towards film and television? Well, I started off making a lot of electronic music mm -hmm. at home in my bedroom, just off a four track, at a four track and one keyboard, which was a Korg wave station. And as a result, I could program it like crazy well because that's all I had. I didn't even have a sequencer at first. I just would just do stuff onto tape. Um, I even used to go to like Woolworths and buy, I used to get cassette singles uh -huh. and they would dump all the old ones that didn't sell for like 9p each. <laughs> so I'd even like buy those cassettes because they're really good like four minute cassettes to like make single tracks on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I used to just do a lot of that in my bedroom, just making weird electronic music, like kind of quite avant-garde sort of music concrete, ambient -y mm. kind of stuff in the 90s. And through that, I started just making things and giving out tapes. And then someone heard them, this DJ, and ended up getting a, a record out on a very obscure German label uh -huh. called Fax. And then the director heard that, and then he um, got me to score one of his documentaries he was making, um, which was one of the, you know, that was the first time I'd really written to picture, or written for picture. Were you kind of aware of the composers working during that time? Were you like, oh, that's kind of, I mean, you know. The yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I was into like John Barry and Morricone, but it was still quite early days. Yeah. And then I was like, I grew up more on synthesizer kind of music, like Vangelis, Jean-Michel mm. Jarre, people like that. Right. And then there's the whole kind of, period in the 90s, a very interesting electronic music that became kind of mainstream, people like the Future Sound London, the Orb, all these kind of electronic acts. And so that kind of stuff really got me very excited into music. And and then I kind of moved into the world of sort of TV music, really. Right, because that you started, uh, one of your first projects was for television, right? Yeah, I mean, I, most of my stuff was for TV, so yeah. I basically started like at the bottom of TV and then just worked in TV. Because you did TV and a lot of TV documentaries and, and stuff like that. And I mean, you did score, you've scored a, a lot of documentaries. Yeah. Um, kind of early in your career wor and, you know, working on those documentaries and now you're doing kind of some big biopics and stuff like that. Yeah. When you're kind of covering true story, whether it's in a documentary or, or inspired by a true story, is there a different technique, something that you kind of try to pull from the real world or the story itself? I mean, yeah, every job is kind of different. You know, if you're doing a TV documentary, you've got very different facilities at your disposal right. to, like, a big feature film. Yeah. Um, and it's, like, you cut your cloth kind of accordingly on what you'll do. But I think every project is kind of different. You approach it. I don't go, hey, I'm doing a biopic, so I have to approach it this way. I just right. look at what the story is and yeah. then be like, okay, here's my s silly idea for this score. Let's see if I can make it work. Right. And uh, I remember talking with John Powell, and he mentioned something. Did you know him growing up? Yeah, I met, well, yeah, weirdly, John's, <laughs> um, an old girlfriend of mine uh, was very good friends with John's um, uh, wife, mm -hmm. who sadly died a few right, years um, ago. And I first met John with, so my girlfriend was doing a photo shoot with Melinda on the Millennium Bridge at two in the morning. <laughs> And I'd been out somewhere, and she's always like, oh, you should meet John Powell. You know, he's like this big composer. And I'm like, yeah, I know who he is. <laughs> um, and so we, I arranged to meet her, and she's like, oh, John might be there as well. So I cycled. I'd been out somewhere else, and I ended up on the Millennium Bridge with John at like 2 in the morning. While they were taking photos, um, I just chatted to John for like an hour in like total like freezing cold British autumn or whatever it was yeah. at like two in the morning. Very cool, very surreal moment. Yeah. Like the Millennium Bridge is that one that goes from St. Paul's to the Tate. Uh -huh. um, and John's, John was like a really awesome guy. Well, not, he is. He's yeah. just like, just very down to earth and dry and British. Yes. Which, and kind of doesn't really give a fuck about like the whole Hollywood thing, which is really 
and he gave me some very good advice, which I still use to this day. So, will you share any of that advice? Uh, <laughs> no, 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 he's just like very level headed yes, and just very pragmatic about the realities of working on big Hollywood films and you know, like you know, what people are looking for, yeah. from a composer. And speaking of Hollywood, I mean. I mean, one of the reasons we're sitting at my place is that you, you are based out of the UK still. Yeah. Uh, what was the, did, did you ever contemplate moving here to, to continue cur your career? What was the kind of decision to stay I, there? And I think, A, I like riding a bike. I hate <laughs> driving cars, so I won't last very long here. <laughs> I'm too, like, I like not being here. Like, it's fun to come here for a bit, but yeah. it's also fun to be outside this world. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've not got the influences that everyone else has got. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I like acting like an idiot and being sarcastic and you know all these kind of things that w would make me a very unpopular here within about two <laughs> weeks so by being an exotic commodity who doesn't live here I think probably works in my favor did you find any challenges um, kind of jump-starting your career by not relocating to Los Angeles because everyone's like LA LA gotta come well, here no because I never really wanted to do like I, like I wasn't really like I just want to become a big Hollywood film composer I just like doing what I was doing so mm -hmm. I was always just like I just want to make cool music and you know, well, hopefully what I think is cool music but <laughs> I just wanted to make you know I just wanted to work and just do interesting stuff and I wasn't you know I'm not fascinated by doing the biggest film mm -hmm. you know, I'd much rather do work I was proud of right Absolutely. than do a massive film that, that was just copying lots of temp um, and weirdly through that I ended up here I just, you know, I just try to keep doing interesting work and then directors saw it and they liked it and they wanted to work with me again. Mm -hmm. And so it was this weird thing where I'm like, how the hell, even when I come here, I'm like, how the hell am I having these weird meetings with like massive film directors and studios? And um, yeah, it's even, I, I am slightly confused about how it's all kind of worked out. But hey, I'm not complaining, it's cool. Yeah, of but, course. <laughs> but I think, you know, even my setup at home is like, it's really um you know, I, it's like really low key and yeah. like, I just, it forces me to, you know, I don't have an assistant. I just do everything myself pretty much. So it's very different to the setups over here. Yeah, for sure. No, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons that well, the first time I became aware of your music, uh, I used to play a game called the movies. Oh yeah. And it way was, ahead of his time, <laughs> which was, uh, if nobody knows what that is, it's yeah. kind of, no like, one knows what it is. It's kind of like Sims for, for film school. <laughs> people where you create your own studio and you make you know you create your post-production house and, you just, and it either makes money or doesn't make money but and i remember my brother and i would play it and we like we loved the music because yeah. you got to really play with all these different genres and kind of almost take your own spin i mean there was like i remember the western music i remember like the, the film noir the drama what was it like doing that that, that game was this crazy like it's probably really important in some ways that game because i didn't know what i was doing i was just told can you make the movie music of the last 100 years, like every movie <laughs> genre of the last 100 years on this like budget, which was like, like now you'd look at it and go, what? <laughs> but because I'd never done it, it's just like, yeah, sure. That sounds really exciting. Right. And so it was just this insane baptism of fire. Just like, right, let's just do everything and try and work out how to make like everything from kind of like Bernard Herrmann sort of scores yeah. to like seventies, sort of black exploitation to like 80s Giorgio Moroder scores to like Gone with the Wind and yeah, that's everything and it was just like just pulling apart stuff and it was really actually probably very helpful for me just in terms of like okay let's just do this and see what ha happens I, th I think I kind of try and do that all the time anyway of just like oh I don't know how this is going to work but let's yeah. just try and and just you, go ahead I mean, and do it. were you familiar with all those styles or did you have to go kind of research and re listen to everything and kind of capture that and try to make it your own there yeah there were things where I was like very familiar with certain you know like composers and other stuff I wasn't and um, yeah some things came more easily than others right. but um, yeah that was a nuts that was a really nuts project I mean I really love that project yeah, and, and, it's, it's still still and I didn't want it to sound like my you know the idea was it didn't want to sound like me because it wanted to sound like movie from those periods exactly so um, although there was one track that sounds a bit too much like uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> no, I remember. Yeah, you're like, I mean, I heard that, I was like, hmm, yeah, probably good that film was, that project wasn't that t such a big hit. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe getting a call from some lawyers. <laughs> um, I do want to talk about something 
what I really love kind of about your work is you, you connect with these great directors and you build these great working relationships and uh, one of the kind of ones that you did kind of early on not that early but pretty recently uh, Nick Murphy who you did, did uh, The Awakening yeah. in Blood with um, hey look you got the CD here I do so we can make this like a kind of like a side thing um, I wonder if you haven't got the cover. Oh, the cover is there. <laughs> look, we can now make this like an exciting, interactive... Like, so we don't look at my face the whole time. If I put that there, yeah. it's focus, so yeah. I can keep talking. And, and you look, can you can look at the different <laughs> artworks. It's like you're in the movie. <laughs> look, there's the back. There's yeah. the back of the wall. <laughs> I might just hold that there. Like, like, like anyway. So, so, yeah, it's so The Awakening with Nick Murphy. Right, so, I mean... Uh, Working with Nick, kind of, what were the? Um, well, had had that happen, or like? Yeah, how did I mean, Nick Nick's a great director. Uh, so I'd worked with him on some TV projects before, um, uh, on a bunch of TV films. One called Napoleon, yeah, it's a really good one, and some other things. And he's just really good at understanding music and how it works, and like, and like what it can bring to a film. Mm -hmm. And I've always done really good work with him, and. You know that was his first feature film, and he yeah. had like he had some really big offers of like other composers he could work with, and who were like names we all know, and he chose me because he worked with me in TV and knew I'd hopefully deliver the goods. Mm -hmm. And you know his that faith in me was kind of kind of what got my career started in a way. Yeah, that was a, that was a big one, and then things I remember just started kind of rolling in yeah. after that. Um, one of which you got connected with Ridley Scott, yeah. and uh, I think the Vatican was that the first time you. No, the counselor was the like Ridley had seen the Awakening. Okay. Like the Awakening kind of disappeared a bit. It was a, like really, I thought it was a great movie, but it sort of just didn't do anything. Right. Um, and uh, but Ridley saw it, and then one day just comes into the edit and just goes, "I've seen this movie, blah blah blah. I think it's great." And the editor says this guy Pietro Scalia, an amazing editor. Yeah, and I'd done a short film with him called Ghost Recon. Okay. Um, Based on a video game called Ghost Recon. Yeah, yeah. Funny that. Um, <laughs> and so I'd got I'd worked with Pietro before, and we got on very well. And he was like, "Yeah, it's that guy I was telling you about." And Ridley's like, "Well, I want to meet him now." So I had a meeting with Ridley, and we got on really well. And then suddenly he's like, "Do you want to score my movie?" And I'm like, "Uh, yeah." But <laughs> like, okay, that was quite a weird moment. Yeah, and what kind of director is Ridley? Is he a particular? I mean, is he vocal on what he wants musically? Because I mean, he's. You know, from the past, he's working with Vangelis and Jerry Goldsmith and Hans Zimmer for a long time, and then Mark Streitenfeld, and then, I mean, what he came from all this history. I mean, what kind? Of, how is he to work with as a composer? I guess. Uh, I I mean, I've just done this new film with him, yeah, um, and that's been great. And I always really like working with him. He's kind of, he gives you a lot of freedom. Like with Ridley, he's like, right, I've heard you. You know, the, you know what you're doing. Yeah. So don't mess around and go. And like, you have to keep up with him. His pace is insane, which has probably been incredibly demonstrated in the last 12 hours I might yeah so the basically that just broke <laughs> yeah so he's just decided to remake the movie he's just made without yeah. Kevin Spacey yeah in six weeks <laughs> yeah and that is a very Ridley move of just like right fuck it let's just do it yeah and he is like and you and you, you, know, you can do anything if you really kind of go right okay let's let's just do this there's so much in all professions you kind of go hmm I do it all the time maybe yeah he, you know, whereas if he, he thought like, about it, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, that's such an instinctive thing to. Yeah, and so he works that way. He's got a very like you've got to keep up, keep up with him, keep up with this pace. Something doesn't work, like try something else. And I'd kind of learned that already through doing so much TV. And he's, I, I find him great. It's like the score for this new film. I'm really excited by. It's yeah. really kind of different for me. Um, the, and the counselor as was a, a great score. Um, unfortunately, the movie didn't do too well. But it, I mean, I loved it, the kind of western take you took on it. And you mentioned Morricone as kind of one of your inspirations, yeah. and and you can hear that in your work, that and Man from Uncle and stuff like that. Um, so, kind of, what was the approach for the counselor? And, and kind of, I remember you talking. I think there was a video. Kind of, was that the guitar orchestra that you were building? Or that well, yeah. I mean, I think the counts. Like, I've always tried to build things that don't sound like everything else. Yeah, and that's like my secret weapon because. Everyone else can do everyone else better than I can. Right. So I can try and do something that's not everyone else, and then I'll be the best at it because I'm the only person doing that one that's not <laughs> like, and it's not even be that good. It just be like this is my take on something. So, right. so with the counselor, yeah, I try to like like layer up a lot of guitar ideas, a lot of guitar textures. Yeah. Um. And, you know, because that became interesting because you you know like you look at music like so much film music is just orchestral. Yeah. It, it, which is great. But there's so many different ways you can layer sound, and we're so 
built towards just one system of layering it and you know it works very effectively you know the orchestra is a system of just the, the idea of an orchestra is is you know just lots of different instruments yes yeah but we have we have like sort of decided that this one thing of like you know 14 strings on the first 10 on the seconds you know eight violas eight cellos four basses or whatever that's kind of like here's our, our lineup and it's i always love those kind of scores like you know early herman scores where you know he was doing like twilight zone or something and jerry right. jerry goldsmith when they didn't have those kind of lineups and they'd be like hey i'm gonna have like eight flutes one bassoon and a timpani yeah and you're like okay that's just a different you have to write differently and it makes you write differently and it makes you come up with something that's more unusual more unique because with an orchestra you can always like it sounds amazing a big orchestra and it's a very easy way to get out of trouble like everything sounds filmic as soon as you have an orchestra mm -hmm. player it sounds classy and quality but I like trying to find out how can I get different sound through doing it differently. Is it a long process to find, I mean, to sound, do you kind of know the sound in your head already before you attempt it? Like, how do you know, like, okay, I'm going to layer a bunch of guitars for the counselor? Like, what was the kind of point that you, that kind of drew that out of you? I've got a guitar at home so I could multi-track it. That's what it came <laughs> down to. Like, if I had like a bunch of flutes that I could play, it might have been a bunch of flutes. But, um... <laughs> There's, there's an element of that like that is quite a big element actually like I can sort of somehow bumble my way through this um, but you know I'm always like you, there's a bit of experimentation you've got some things you think are going to work yeah some things you can prove can work some things I'll just make up in the studio where we'll be like we'll be doing something and we'll be like that sounds great like on this new score um, all the money in the world mm -hmm. Ridley's new film there's lots of different ideas that come back a number of times in the score but we did the stuff with like these clarinet clusters that were like uh just very uh close voicings on five clarinets right and what was fascinating is when they'd play them the uh, the actual entry points would always be slightly off and if you're cl cleaning up the score you'd be like right let's just fade them in uh -huh. but i love the randomness of the entry points being all slightly off because if you're trying to get to play really softly all yeah. at the same time all really close voicing it becomes very hard to get it like bang on the beat the whole time yeah. so the imperfection of them not hitting those moments made all those chords really interesting and then we found out that hey let's try doubling that up on an accordion we tried it yeah it didn't sound so good but mm. if you put on a really high register it sounded freaking crazy yeah so and then we're like, right, let's double that up on boom, boom, boom. Right, where's the score? Right, these chords, dun, dun, dun. Let's put that on the accordion. And so you suddenly like rearrange some things in the sessions wow. that you wouldn't know if they worked. And I'd suddenly just have an idea and you'd be like, okay, let's try that out. And you'd be like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And then that's really helped by when you have directors like Ridley who will just l let you have the freedom to say, hey, I think you're going to, I trust what you're going to do. doesn't mean they're always going to like it, but mm -hmm. I think when you... I think there's an element of doing demos that are so perfect that when you go and record them, you're not going to change anything. Whereas I always try and write things that are sort of like halfway there mm -hmm. and it's going to get better at the end. Uh, yeah. Which is what I always tell the directors when they go, this doesn't sound I'm like, hey, it's all going to be fine, trust me. <laughs> um, does the, the, fa does the, the time setting of the film, does that affect kind of the instrumentation and the style of the music that you... Well, yeah, no, I mean, I always try and come up with a concept, mm -hmm. like, like, I try and come up with a solid, but it can affect it, to, you know, you have a period piece and you might want to do the electronics, because right. that's going to be more interesting. So it's, the t you know, like, this film, All the Money in the World, is set in the 70s, mm -hmm. but I've completely ignored that okay, in wow. terms of how the music's set, whereas The Man from Uncle is all set in the 60s, and I've completely embraced it. Yeah. So every project is different on like how you want to what you want to take from from the film so I'll try and sometimes really grasp on certain elements ignore certain other ones but I think it's good when you have like a strong kind of voice and an idea for the score and then mm -hmm. try and carry on with that and uh, for all the money in the world you know we just talked about it just broke today or yesterday um, you know, the whole allegations with Kevin Spacey forced Ridley to make this kind of gut decision yeah. to recast him with Christopher Plummer and he's going to go reshoot all of Kevin's scenes in 
and the movie comes out in six weeks. Yep. Has it? Are they going to just shoot shot for shot and keep your score as is, or are you going to have to do some tweaking? I don't know. You don't know. Like, I only happened like last night, so yeah. I don't know what they're going to do. Like Ridley, like if anyone can do it, Ridley can do it. Like he is like, like I can say he's a force of nature. Yeah. And he'll be like, right, we're going to do this. Like, <laughs> so you know, it's like he's eighty, like in two weeks' time. Yeah. And yeah, so I guess that doesn't sound lady doesn't act eighty. I guess that party is probably put on ice for a bit. Yeah. He'd probably have a big birthday party and do all that as well. <laughs> It's, it is his birthday party. That that, yeah. that thing seems like something he would want to do in his birthday party. We were talking about Morricone a, a bit earlier, and I love that you kind of and he's kind of he inspires you, and you kind of embrace that in, in your style. Um, and one of the similarities that I've noticed, the reason why I kind of love your music is it feels tactile. Like I feel like I can touch it and yeah. grab it, and I can feel the textures. And it's very similar to how Morricone did the Spaghetti Westerns, which were completely opposite of what the time where you see these big Max Steiner scores and, and John Ford Westerns and then it was just like electric guitar. Yeah. So is that kind of something that you embrace, that kind of tactile feel of the, of the music to, in, in your style currently? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on the score, but like, you know, things like King Arthur, that score was meant to feel incredibly tactile and mm. you're really meant to feel the textures. Like, melodically, it's kind of not that exciting. Right. But sonically, it's like so rich and dirty and coarse. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the way Morricone used instrumentation is incredible. Like he, he had like two things, amazing instrumentation, just amazing melodic writing. Yeah. And like super emotional on both fronts. And I love that experimental side of the sounds of just like unusual noises coming together and creating, you know, like, things you'd never heard before. Yeah. And like very witty, very clever, very moving. Um, but then combining that with like a music musicality, which I think you often have composers who are very musical and write incredibly exciting, complex pieces of music. But sonically, they're kind of like, maybe you've heard them before. Mm. I mean, we have people who are sonically really exciting, but they don't write very exciting music. They just write a lot of noise. Yeah. It's a really cool noise, but it's a lot of noise. So I love the way Morricone would like take those two worlds bring them together and I guess that's something I've tried to do a lot with what I'm trying to do no that comes for sure that comes across um, do you have a favorite Morricone score is it hard uh, I mean my favorite Morricone track is probably Navajo Joe oh my god because it's just so unbelievably nuts like yeah. in that kind of <laughs> like like wow where did that come from yeah and just that kind of like 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 that sort of punch of Morricone is just like ah, ah, ah. yeah um, but I mean, there's so many Morricone. Oh, I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, like 700, if you ever get really bored, like go on Spotify, <laughs> load up Morricone and hit shuffle. Because <laughs> there's obviously like, you know, like 800 pieces on there, like exactly. thousands. And it's just amazing to jump through someone's life's catalogue like that and have such a crazy eclectic listening experience. Everything is so different, yeah, from one to the next. Um, so we're talking about directors you're working with, yeah. like Nick Murphy and Ridley Scott, and Guy Ritchie's another one that you've, we did Man, with, Man, Man from Uncle and um, King Arthur. Yeah. And Guy is such a insane, awesome auteur director with such a visual style. And definitely that bleeds into your music for his movies because, I mean, Man from Uncle is just... Whew, and then Man, and King Arthur is exactly the same. What kind of director is Guy compared to all the other directors you work with? Guy is a very different director to most directors <laughs> I work with, which is, uh, you know, he's definitely very, very different in yeah. his approach on every level um, and he's you know he's pretty challenging to work with yeah um, is he hard to please oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah um, but he does know the value of music in a film and he knows what music can bring to a film and he lets music drive his films yeah. so it's a really important part of his movies and he, his greatest asset is the fact that he doesn't want his movies to sound or look or behave in the way all other movies behave yeah so the stuff he gets excited by is the stuff that's the more unusual and the more avant-garde and not as the avant-garde just the kind of ideas you haven't necessarily heard before on that kind of scene so as a composer it's like super challenging to do stuff that he likes and, but when you get it right, it's really exciting. Yeah. And the way it can drive sequences and uh, and make films work is, you know, it's, like for composers, it's winning because, you know, he often describes his movies as like, hey, I'm just making it like 12 music videos. Yeah. Uh, put together. 
<laughs> so you have like a like the like composer is great because you get to really like really showcase what you do right but getting to that point is difficult yeah i mean looking at all his films i mean i love snatch and lock stock and yeah and even the stuff he did with hans with sherlock holmes is just yeah those fantastic. sherlock scores like amazing like, yeah. i love those sherlock scores snatch is a great film lock yeah. stock's great and that was quite daunting as well, just to follow those scores, because they're yeah. such great scores. Well, and Man From Uncle, I think, was one of my favorite of the year. I mean, yeah. what you did there. And what I noticed kind of, and maybe this is just me, because I'm not a musician, so tell me yeah. if, I'm, if I'm seeing something wrong, uh, the scores you do for Guy, they kind of almost have like a looping tendency where they just feel like they can exist and he can fit. Yeah, Guy stuff. doesn't, basically, Guy doesn't like melodic elements so much he likes very rhythmic elements okay yeah he, he responds well to that so the tracks end up being more sparse musically and mm -hmm. a lot more driven by groove and rhythm and it's yeah. finding ways of keeping the momentum and the rhythm but still keeping them interesting right and king arthur was extremely interesting and i love i mean where did the idea for the, the breathing come from this kind of rhythmic because it kind of, i noticed in man from uncle the flute very much yeah. was very almost you could feel the air being yeah. blown into the flute and and then it kind of evolved almost into that ry rhythmic breathing yeah king arthur i mean so the, that that was like actually i'd have to say like hey i'm really clever and it's my idea but it's actually he's got a brilliant editor guy this guy called james herbert mm -hmm. james is like an amazing amazing editor and he always has like great crazy ideas and he knows that guy will like this crazy idea and we, we had a track and he was just like just try some breathing on it and so i started trying to do that you know i just started this breathing and it suddenly was just like, those are your your breaths? that's me yes it's me on the film yeah. it's me screaming as well it was uh, like <laughs> i was like we're gonna go re-record this uh you and they were like <laughs> and they were like we don't need to it sounds great and i'm like really and the first time it was in i was just like this is really weird because i just did it as a like often I'd have to I'd have to come up with ideas and they'd be ready the next day. So yeah. it's like crazy, crazy, crazy turnaround all the time, and you get ideas that stick or ideas that go in the bin. You have so many ideas that go in the bin. Yeah. And every now and again one sticks, and the breathing and screaming one kind of just stuck. And then we kind of got used to the vocals, and so I ended up doing like screaming and breathing on that. Which did you, you hyperventilate during that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the me me doing the screaming is there's like some little videos of it somewhere. It's pretty yeah. crazy. <laughs> um, so. Kind of in a different direction um, uh, from Guy Ritchie. He did a great film called Cuban Fury. Um, oh, wow. This is <laughs> in depth. Um, which is a completely different genre, of course, comedy. Uh, and you do a great show, Peep Show, which yes. is awesome. I just actually recently got into that. Yeah. And I'm watching it on Amazon Prime and the, just just the comedy of it. And so when you when you work in that kind of genre, I mean, Cuban Fury and Peep Show are completely different. But, yeah. Um, what is, I guess, the key to a great comedic score, I mean, in your opinion? I think comedy scores are really hard to do. And I, I think, think they're the hardest, wouldn't they? I think <laughs> you get no respect for doing comedy of scores. Yeah. Like, comedy composers always get kind of, like, typecast. Um, you know, like, Rupert Quicks and William Trey just, just got seen as this comedy guy, and he's an amazing composer, and you yeah. see that on, like, Hacksaw and, like, Wonder Woman and things. But, and it's a real difficult skill, um, because you've got to get the tone right, and trying to get the tone right for each project is very different sometimes yeah. it needs to be played very straight sometimes you need to kind of wink a bit sometimes you need to like hit people on the head saying this is funny yeah um if you're doing that it's probably not a very good comedy <laughs> but um it's yeah it's tricky it's trying to find enough that gives you a lightness mm -hmm. but if you go too far you just it feels like you're hitting people on the head yeah and peep show is just you know because it's all pov from i mean like my music to peep show to be honest is pretty much yeah <laughs> Which is like still my claim to fame, sadly. It's like, I've done all this stuff. And, Have you seen that? No, I haven't seen that. Have you seen that? I haven't seen that. Have you seen that? Oh, is that the one with Ashton Kutcher? No, it's the other one. Oh, I never saw that. But, yeah, so, have you seen Peep Show? Oh, yeah, I've seen Peep Show. Yeah, so, but I love Peep Show. Peep Show is a, like a very good comedy. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's just brilliant writing, too. Um, and uh, so, uh, jumping back into directors, you got to work with Danny Boyle uh, yeah. on Steve Jobs. And... There had already been, I think, the other Steve Jobs movie had already come out with Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> Hence that bad joke. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and this also introduced you to Aaron Sorkin, who now yeah. you're working with on Molly's Game. But um, when you, and we talked about biopics a little bit earlier, but when you're kind of taking on a figure like Steve Jobs, uh, did you treat him as a real person? Or did you look at the character that Michael was playing and kind of pull the music out of that? 
No, with Steve Jobs, we're kind of looking, I think I came in looking at the concept behind the script, uh -huh. which is this three act structure, the way Danny was shooting it, three different, three, you know, three different um, uh, styles of, of filming, three different locations. So that became like a really big thing early on of like trying to like embrace these three different acts mm -hmm. of the film. Um, and you know, we have like an 80s electronics analog, we have like the opera yeah. score and then we have like the digital score. But at the same time you are embracing all these elements of Steve Jobs as a character, you've got kind of like in like the third act, the kind of super clean, minimal iPad kind of um, design side of Steve Jobs. And then like the second act, you have this like super theatrical orchestral element, which is part of his personality. You know, it's like yeah. P.T. Barnum, almost like just incredibly uh, theatrical way of presenting information. When he gets on that stage, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you're embracing all these different elements of him as a character. Um, but yeah, that, and again, that was a lot. That was Danny. Danny is another director who really understands what music can bring to a film mm -hmm. and the importance of it. So again, like Danny was a great director to work with because he gets very excited by music and really like, you know, understands like how to work on it and how to build sequences with it and how you can kind of work together to get there. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, was, I love Danny and the work he has, it was really great. And uh, so, I'm guessing that led to you working with Aaron on Molly's game. Was did you guys meet on? Yes, yeah, so I met on after I finished Steve Jobs. We did some like press and award stuff, and uh -huh. I met Aaron through that. Um, and we went to the Golden Globes together with Molly randomly. Wow, the original Molly, like the real Molly. Yeah. And so yeah, we were just there and um, got chatting, and you know he said I'm going to make this film in a couple of years. Well, next with with about this this uh, Molly who was on our table. Yeah. And yeah, and then just got a, you know, we got Chang and then he asked me to do it and it's it's been an amazing experience. Like he's like for a guy who you know, he's technically a first-time director. Yeah, this is like when you see the film, yeah. you'd just be like it looks like this guy's been directing all his life. Yeah. You know, like oh, he writes as well. Yeah. But he's a director. <laughs> like it's a great film yeah. and it's got a lot of great bits of cinema in it as well as like the usual fantastic like Sorkin script. Um pacing and but you know as a director he was again I mean I've, I just think I've been very lucky I've just worked with lots I mean the thing yeah. is if you work with some good people yeah. it makes your life a lot easier so no, for sure no, so that's why I'm, I think one of the greatest things about your career is all these amazing directors and collaborators that you've worked with and I think it brings the best out of everybody when everyone is, is like that and but did you notice kind of working with him and you did work with uh, Stephen Gagan on uh, Gold yeah. who's also primarily a writer but he's directed before do you notice the difference working with a writer director like that where I mean the written word is their kind of bread and butter well they're probably a hard, they're like they're, they're more likely to not want to give up certain bits of dialogue okay <laughs> yeah. and I mean, Aaron's film says you know the dialogue is such an important part yeah. of the experience right. is you have to write stuff that's not going to get in the way of that sonically and give yeah. it space but at the same time you know we did have like a like a you know the opening of the film I'd be like pushing for like we need less dialogue here like mm. we have so much dialogue like the music's got to have more impact because we need to set this idea up otherwise like it makes more sense when you see the film there's this right. big opening the ski thing and the music's a big part of that and by stripping out some of it you know we, I would say like I think you need less here like nowhere else which I would say to any director, I'd say, look, I think this sequence is going to work better for the film if we do this here or this. And they can just be like, yeah, go screw yourself yeah. in the director. But the really good directors will want to know why you think that. Yeah. And, you know, they can disagree. But, you know, someone like Ridley Scott, I think, is another example of someone people think would be terrifying and you couldn't say anything to him. But, you know, I, you can totally have discussions like or arguments. I've had a big argument with Ridley over one scene in the movie and it's like... He's like, okay, I hear you. We'll try both sequences and just see, you know, how I feel about it. But did he go with yours? Uh, I still don't know, actually. <laughs> can you have an argument with Guy? Uh, yep, <laughs> you can. <laughs> and I might have had a couple of those. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, so I mean, uh, we're sort of talking about Molly's game and uh, and Gold was another kind of great 
example of just you know dialogue and, and kind of the script. Yeah. Uh, how often? I mean, and the, that kind of showcases an amazing performance for Matthew McConaughey. And how much does the performance affect uh, your writing? I guess it will differ from project to project, but is it part of your process to kind of look at the performance? Well, yeah, because you got to work out like how much do you need to give it musically. Like mm -hmm. you know, if you've got like a very nuanced performance, sometimes you want to hold back. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got like a kind of big performance, maybe you can go with that, or maybe you want to give it space. I mean, it all depends on the film, and like part of the job is just trying to like just like just work out what the tone is and what what will make the film exciting. I'm always thinking about what will make the film exciting for the audience. You don't want to overpower them with the music. Yeah, like we've gone really big in Getty in certain places in the all the oh, money, money in the world. world. Yeah, like you know, we've got like some big classical pieces, like really kind of grand. But that works with Getty's character. Right. Um, and you put them over a different... Like, stuff we'd written for Getty, you put over a different character in the film, it would just look stupid. Yeah. But his sort of stature and his world he's built, the architecture of his world, you know, it works. So mm -hmm. you're, you're feeding off so many things, whether it's just the visual, visual cues, like Ridley's films, you really play off visual cues quite heavily. You know, where you look at Aaron's film, I'm dealing a lot more with the pacing the um the dialogue and the momentum of scenes um whereas Ridley I might be dealing a lot more with like the architecture of of a, of a place it's being shot in or the lighting right. um so every director has like and like guy it's like it's like pace momentum like how we're working with the edit so everyone has different ways of of collaborating in a way of like what you pick up as a composer it um does does guy do do guys films? Does do, do the edits change a lot on those? I feel like that's a thing that he tries to. F yep, to edit changes like every day. Every day. So yeah. I mean, I know I've talked to other uh, direct I mean, composers who work kind of with that, like Steve Jablonski on Transformers. Yeah. The edits are always changing. How do you, as a composer, work with that so that your score doesn't just collapse? I mean, because if something changes here, then then that could affect something yeah, here. Yeah, that's the whole like that's the whole million dollar question is like you just have to somehow keep going it's kind of like running a marathon like, right, like running a marathon you get the finish line and they go oh you're meant to go that way yeah now okay I'll go that way okay so you run the marathon that way you get to the end and they're like oh now, well, now you want to go that way okay and then you just keep and you just have to keep going and it's kind of this insane like um, just test I'm even kind of amazed I got through it sometimes of just right just constantly going and, but also at the same time try not to give up and try to keep your own identity and it's so easy to fall back on what people think they want yeah and I don't want to give them that I don't want to give them the easy way out mm. that you've heard before and that makes my life very difficult sometimes because I'm trying to push it as far as I can because I don't want to deliver music you've heard on a million things before I want to deliver things that you've hopefully not really experienced like I always think cool scores are like ones where you go like I have no idea what where I would have heard that kind of thing right before so when I mean that that approach is really amazing but we, you you work in an industry that kind of thrives on temp scores too so when you get given a temp I mean and a director is stuck on a temp and you're like I don't want to do what was done before is that a fight that is I mean yeah I mean I try and not get in those situations and yeah. I try and temp the movie myself with ideas early on uh -huh. and it's kind of a bit like a weird race of just trying to keep up with the edit and right and, you know, some films, like I'm just trying to think, I did this film called Felt earlier this year, which yeah, is a Watergate like film, and that was like, I came on that very late, and that would already been tempted with a million, but I could just look at it and go, okay, I can see this works, this works, this doesn't, right. and totally ignore it, but just see what they're trying to create with the temp in terms of tension, and things being hit. Yeah. Um, but, it, so temp can be useful that way, but I kind of like try to build a world, and that's sometimes about having like not, too much in it yeah and allow you to write you know it's like trying to paint a picture and instead of having every color available you've only got red and black and right blue. yeah <laughs> and then it's like you're gonna paint a different kind of picture and whatever you paint they're all gonna feel like there's some kind of continuity between them all yeah absolutely looking at your approach overall and I know every film's gonna be different um, but for you where does the first note come from I mean where are you I mean does lightning does inspiration strike from the same place every time or are you are you sitting there working on themes first? Are you sitting and just find that, that texture that's right for the, the film? I, I don't know. Everything can... Every film's different. Like, um, 
on like Aaron Sorkin's um, Molly's Game. I started messing around. I wanted to feel like a band had written a score. Uh-huh. And, you know, I started off with all these ideas. I had this like, really early idea. I thought this is really cool. It's really laid back. Cause, like, I was kind of like, what is this film? And I was thinking it's about poker and poker is not actually about speed. It's about holding stuff back and right. being restrained. So I wrote all this stuff that was kind of like these very sort of slow, sort of hip hop guitar tracks um, that were kind of, there's a, uh, guy called Dark Star, that band called Dark Star, really cool, like held back stuff. And I was like, oh, I like that idea. But then it didn't work because it didn't have the pacing. Yeah. And it's like, right, boom, out the window. Yeah. And that was my first idea. And it was like, it felt great. And it was completely wrong. And none of those tracks ended up in it. <laughs> and then, whereas the Ridley's film, I came up with this idea early on. The first thing I wrote was the opening theme. And um, I wrote two different ideas for the opening. And what was interesting was I really liked the first one, but the editor wasn't sure. So I said, I'll rewrite it and come up with a different idea. So I wrote a different idea. I was like, oh, actually, that's way better. Yeah. But the first one had this cool little motif. boo ba ba boo ba boo ba ba boo ba It's a little flute thing, really simple. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, that's good. What if I can get that in that other theme? I was like, oh, yeah, I could put it right at the beginning and then go to this theme. So then you had these two thematic ideas, and I could then pull this one all over the score. And it worked really like effortlessly. That that wow. was quite an effortless project. And uh, so, kind of overall, what is your, I guess, your most favorite part of the process from like start to finish? Is there a favorite part that kind of like oh, I can't wait to get to this part? Or I like when I know what I'm doing. Uh huh. Like okay, now we're doing like now we just make stuff. When you found the idea, I yeah. Guess the genesis and I thing. like. I think I like recording, and mixing when it comes together. But it's also very tiring. Yeah, yeah. My favorite bit in any film is the bit when you're writing and you come up with something and you're like, oh my God, I've got something really exciting here. Yeah. I mean, the trouble is you, you then play it to a director and they go, I don't like it. But <laughs> that moment of like, oh, I've got it. Like, it's really exciting. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's the bit I love. And also when sequences where you're like, okay, this is kind of cool. I haven't seen something like this. Or this feels, this feels cool. And you're like, this is drawing me in like there's a, in all the money we've got this great sequence where there's this police raid and it's just like stripping the music really quiet we've got mm-hmm. like these very close clarinet voicings it's a very tiny pulse and it's really like as a piece of music it's not very exciting it's dig 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 but the way the scene works it just totally draws you in and, and they tempt it with something, they put something over that's way bigger. I was just like, ah, let's try this. And it's right. just, it was really exciting to watch this thing being the opposite of what you'd expect a kind of police raid to be and just making it just really tense. Right. And how that, that sort of drew you in. Right. And so I love those bits where you think, oh, I've cracked this in a really cool way. Yeah. And what is the, uh, the your least favorite part of the process? Is there like one that you just... And my least favorite part of the process is when I don't know what they want and I have no idea what on earth they want over a scene and they've given me like 17 different I, conflicting notes uh-huh. and you're like I don't know what I'm doing anymore like if, if I get a note and I'm like okay I, you know that's not what I thought but you know I get what you want to do as a director like right. I understand that but when I'm just like why why would you like yeah that's the worst the worst in the world where you and also especially if you've done a scene like six seven different ways yeah and oh, that, they don't know what they want, but that hasn't <laughs> happened that much this year. So. Well, that's good. <laughs> um, so to wrap things up, you did an amazing uh, film, felt uh, the man who was the man who brought down Washington. Worst title ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is about Deep Throat and Watergate. Yeah. Um, let's say I bring you a movie about the current U.S. political situation, and yeah. you have to score a Donald Trump movie. What kind of approach would you take for Donald Trump? I'd probably like just on that question. Yakety sax, you know the Benny Hill music. <laughs> yes. I think there's something about Trump where he, you'd want to undermine him in some ways because he presents himself as such an expert. Probably he's probably the world's greatest expert. Like, would you play people, it straight in people, his head? Like people he have said himself? to me, "I am the world's greatest expert." You know, like, um, and it would be interesting to like really really undermine that musically because it's so transparent that he's not the world's greatest expert yeah. at experts <laughs> but it might be too much but and again it's difficult because it's like are you going to make him into a buff- like, like a buffoon or yeah, a, yeah does that 
you know, like there's so many different ways of, of scoring it. You're like, right, is this something very sinister? Like, like my gut would be to play him more as a, a buffoon out of his depth, uh -huh. which is, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying he is a buffoon out of his depth. <laughs> Am I? Um, <laughs> but it would appear that maybe he is. Um, it depends which, again, it all depends. I mean, it's quite interesting question. It's like, depends yeah, which way it, you... It depends on the tone of the film, sure. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. whose viewpoint it is. Like, in the way of, like, the way Trump is probably seeing the world, it, it would be this most epic, orchestral, like... In fact, some of the stuff I've done for Getty would probably work quite well for how Trump sees himself. Or remember how he'd, wa he'd walk onto the stage with Jerry Goldsmith's Air Force One playing, yeah. and they'd call, they'd stop that, and stop playing Jerry's music. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he sees him with that. I think he sees himself with that patriotic kind of bravado it was quite cool to have a film that was like two viewpoints it was like Trump's viewpoint and Mueller's everyone and else's Trump's. <laughs> everyone else's viewpoint yeah well if they do make a biopic about Trump I hope they call you <laughs> I don't no. <laughs> uh, Danny I want to thank you so much for your time tonight it was okay. such a pleasure thanks so right. much thanks so much